Well, good morning, everybody here on campus and those joining us online, wherever you might be. Hey, grab your Bible or turn on your digital device. We're going to be in the end of Acts 7, and then we're going to take another look at what Emily just shared from Acts chapter 8 uh, together this, this morning, okay? So Acts 7 and Acts 8 right there together. Uh, you know, all of us uh, at some point during the week probably were driving an automobile somewhere, someplace. And if you're at all like I am, um, when I see that state trooper over to the side, um, <laughs> you know exactly, right? It's just like your heart kind of holds. Well, there's a story about a, a state trooper who, uh, he was on the side of the road and he was watching traffic and um, uh, a car came by him, but instead of going really, really fast, this car was going extremely slow. When he clocked the car, um, it was going 22 miles an hour uh, in a 55 mile an hour zone. And he noticed there were five elderly ladies in that car. And uh, he decided that, that, that driving too slow could be as dangerous as driving too fast. So he pulled out, put on his lights, and he pulled over uh, that car filled with the five elderly ladies. And uh, as he walked up to the car, and as he approached the window, the, the lady who was driving looked at him rather confused, like, officer, what is, what is the problem? And he said, well, ma'am, uh, understand you're, you're, you're not speeding, but um, you, you are going extremely slow, and it can be just as dangerous driving that slow. Uh, to which she, she replied, and she actually argued and said, officer, I wasn't going too slow. I was going exactly the speed limit. 22 miles an hour at which the <laughs> state trooper tried to hold back his chuckle a little bit and he said <laughs> he said <laughs> he said ma'am <laughs> that's not the speed limit you're on route 22 <laughs> and she apologized of course and and, and, and before he left, he, he said, you know, I, let me just ask, is everybody in the car okay? Because all the other ladies sitting in the car, I mean, they were, you know, like wide-eyed open. I mean, they were white as a ghost. They didn't, they didn't speak a peep the entire time, right? And he said, ma'am, are, are all, is everybody in the car? Is everybody okay? <laughs> and she replied, oh, they'll be fine in just a minute. We just got off of Route 119, Uh, how many of us feel like 2021 20, is a whole lot like that story, right? We're not quite sure anymore what the speed limit is. We're not sure what sign we should be watching. We don't know if we're going too fast, we're going too slow. And somehow we're trying to keep moving forward. Well, that is really the summary of the book of the Acts. You're in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8. But like the whole big story of Acts, it's this huge transition from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, to the foundation of the church. When the Gospels are portrayed, it's all about Jesus. The church hasn't even started yet. It's about Jesus and his disciples and the miracles and, and the crucifixion and the resurrection. And now in Acts chapter, or in, in the book of Acts, everything begins to change. And that's kind of like how we feel today, that like, wait a second, what was... Seems like it's no more. Now we're living in, well, we're not even sure. Do we call this a new normal? What is this? It seems like so many things are changing. Then on top of that, it can feel like, particularly if you're a Christ follower, that you're living in a minority group. It, it, it seems like what used to be like a, you know, a badge of honor in the community, a badge of honor, you know, in society and in culture, that you're a Christ follower, that, that you have values and, you, you know, you aspire to a Judeo-Christian ethic and that w that's the right way to live out your life. And it can feel like all of a sudden everything has flipped. That's exactly where we are in the Bible. At the very end of Acts chapter 7, the story of Jesus, the people who are following Jesus are now, now considered an enemy of the state. They now are considered people who are living counterculture. They're being viewed as dangerous to the greater society. So persecution 
imprisonment becomes the norm. Notice what the Bible says in verse 54, Acts 7. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, in other words, you can, in our language today, it would be the leaders, it'd be the cultural leaders, it would be politicians, the decision makers, the power brokers. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth. What was that? When they were told of the story of Jesus, that following Jesus was the best way to live your life, and it was the only way to die. And that simple statement, it created all kinds of conflict in the leaders, in the power source, in the decision makers of the day. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In other words, all this pressure was coming against Stephen. Stephen, a Christ follower. Stephen making a decision that I'm going to make Jesus the center and the point for my life. And all kinds of pressure comes against him. Economic pressure, political pressure, social pressure. And he's got a decision to make. What will I do next? When we don't understand everything that's happening around us, what will I, what will you do next? There's all kinds of decisions, right? You, you, you can tweet about it. Uh, you can have a, a, a pity party about it. Uh, you can jump on Facebook about it. Uh, you can ignore it. Uh, I, I mean, the question, what are you going to do? Stephen, he decides that he's going to look towards heaven. Verse 56, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling. In other words, because he didn't lean into the cultural space and argue back, and demand his rights, and get all worked up on social media, he pivoted, he looked towards heaven, he looked towards God being his source of strength. He said, I'm going to find my hope, not in what's happening around me, I'm going to find my hope in the story of Jesus who lives in me. It made them even more upset. Look at verse 58. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul who would later become the Apostle Paul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. Now, I don't know about you. When someone's stoning me, I'm usually not asking God to forgive them because they don't know what's going on, right? When, when your ex is, is, is trying to take you, you know, to court for something or your, your boss, your neighbor, you're the, you know, a politician, when things don't go our way, we normally, our tendency is to reach out for revenge. But we see something here in this story that there is a better way to live. Notice as the story continues in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Saul, who later would become the Apostle Paul, which let's just pause for just a moment. Picture in your mind like the biggest rascal that you know in the world. Now, maybe you know them personally, or maybe you don't know them personally, okay? It could be a national figure. It could be somebody who you think the way they live, like there's the devil, and this guy might be right next to the devil or this gal, right? You got a rascal. You got somebody in your mind's eye that like you're like, that person, they, 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 they bad. They, they should, I mean, you wouldn't say it out loud because you're too polite and we're in the South, but in your mind, you're like, they need to go to hell, like, don't, I mean, just, just get there right now. That's a bad, 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 bad. You got that rascal in your mind right now? You got that? Okay. Do you, do you have that person? Okay, okay. Th that's who Saul is. Saul is the dude who's knocking on your door because he found out that you came to Church of Hope. He found out that you're one of these Christ followers, and he had the legal authority of the day to declare that you had hate speech. Uh, declared that you were living counterculture, that, that you were maybe perhaps potentially a domestic terrorist. And he had the authority to arrest you on the spot. Actually had the authority to even kill you. I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about your two little girls. And there's not a thing that you could do to stop him. I think we would, I think we would label him as a big-time rascal that's got no... Li listen, he does not deserve the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. In case you're wondering this morning, 
how God works miraculously. This rascal, this dude named Saul, he becomes the Apostle Paul who writes a third of the New Testament that you're holding in your hands. So for all of us, that rascal, that person that we had in our mind's eye earlier, hey, how about we just go ahead and start praying for him or her, right? And that perhaps potentially their lives will turn from being Saul to Paul. Boy, that really excited you this morning. I'm so glad. I mean, you're just like, yeah, that's exactly how. I woke up today and just thought I was going to pray for Nancy Pelosi and that one day she would. <laughs> or if you're on the other side of the aisle, you say, I'm praying for Donald Trump. I, I, I'm just saying it out loud. Listen, we sang these songs earlier. You've got a Bible open in your lap. I want you to know something. Our heritage, our, our, the story that we believe is, is the God who does the impossible, the miraculous. So just pinch yourself for a minute and say, listen, I'm following the miraculous God. It happened in this story. <laughs> okay, look at verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing him, that was Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Bad things are happening. I mean, all of, the, all of the things that you would let your mind's eye run towards, all the things that you wonder, could, I mean, it's just all throughout Jerusalem, great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. In other words, you couldn't go home to your home. You were, if it happened in Ocala, uh, you would be scattered out, right? You'd be scattered out out, out, out into the countryside. You had to relocate. You couldn't go home tonight. You had to go to a different place. You had to start all, all over. Verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. This is, I mean, this is, this, is, this is challenging. This is not something that any of us would wish or want. But let me give you just a couple things to at least write down in your heart this morning as a source of encouragement. Number this, it, number one would be this, is God's presence and God's promises and God's power remains through the most difficult times and persecution. You might be going through something right now that nobody even knows about what you're going through physically and emotionally uh, with a, a relative or maybe whatever, whatever that is in your life. I just want you to know that, that God's power, God's presence isn't absent during the time of adversity. The book that you're holding in your hand reveals just the opposite. It's in those times the Bible tells us that God is a present help in our times of trouble. You might think, you might wonder, the news might say all kinds of things externally, but if you would put in your, in your own soul this morning that God's power and his presence, it is with you. Let me tell you a second thing. This is really important. That who you look to, right, who you look to when you're going through a difficult time is either going to give you the strength or it's going to take away your strength. In other words, I put it this way. Who you look to gives you strength to go through what troubles you. Who you look to when you go through what troubles you is either going to strengthen you or it's going to weaken you. It is really what Jason said earlier. If you look to cable news, it's either going to strengthen you or weaken you. I, I could make an argument for that. You look towards social media. Who you look to Right When you are going through something that's challenging or difficult, it is either going to strengthen you or it's going to discourage you. That's a great, that, that'd be a great exercise. Who, who am I looking to? And can I just help you? If you want to know who you're looking to, here's how you do it. You, you get a piece of paper or you use your phone and just do a simple diary. And so what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to do a 15-minute. People often tell me, I, you, you know, PMC, I wish I had more time in the day. I, I don't have time for this or I have time for that or do that. I, I, I always encourage them to do what I call a 15-minute audit. 
Because here's, everybody in this room has 24 hours today. Everybody in this room, everybody has time to do whatever in the world that you want to do. You have time to do it. The question is, where's your time going? One great tool to find out where my time is going is to do a time audit. Do a 15-minute audit throughout your day. And just write down what you did in those 15 minutes. And then at the end of the day, look at it. And and if you're here this morning and you're kind of like, you are discouraged and you are depressed and you're kind of convinced that it is the end of the world and there's no hope and and I don't know what we're going to do forward and my kids and I don't know what, I just think I need to become a prepper and I'm moving to some place in North Dakota and I'll be away from all the problems that are around me, right? It's probably a result of who you're looking to because who you look to is either going to strengthen you or weaken you when you go through what you're going through. And let me give you a third thing, is this, is that adversity, when you and I go through adversity, it deepens your faith in God. It deepens your faith in God and strengthens your courage for God. Adversity, we, we often see adversity as something that um, is an indicator that is something that's wrong rather than seeing it as something that might be right. The testing process is, is really, really good. I'm glad that, uh, you know, the consumer products that we've got, that there is a testing ground, there's a proving ground, right? Um, I like to make smoothies at my house, and uh, so I use a blender. I'm glad that my blender went through a time of testing so that when those sharp blades are blending up all the ingredients in my smoothie, those blades don't come off. It would not be good if those blades came off, were in my smoothie, and then I drank it. You understand? it right there is a testing there's a proving ground until that product doesn't pass the test it's not ready for the public right it's same thing in us we as christ followers god is testing us he is preparing us for what he has prepared for us and some of us live in perpetual test mode because we refuse to let god prepare us and so until you let god test you to the point that he's prepared you for what he is uh, uh, has a purpose for you you're going to stay in test mode let me let me say it this way everything that you want think about something that you want in in life Whatever it is in the world that you want, that you need, everything that you want, everything that you need is just outside your comfort zone. Whatever, I don't know what it is, it's your list. What is it that you want? Just put it, it doesn't have to be spiritual. I don't know what it is. Financial, it's health, it's a new pony, I don't know. Whatever that thing is, Put, I, I want you to know something. Everything that you want is outside your comfort zone. I mean, think about it. If it was inside your comfort zone, you would just go over and you'd get it, you'd have it, you'd own it, and you'd be enjoying it. Whatever that thing is that you want, it's outside of your comfort zone. And right now, I, one of the reasons I'm excited about the times in which we live in, in, in 2020, 2021, is that like most everybody's outside their comfort zone right now. And when people are outside their comfort zone, they're hurting. And when we're hurting, the potential for transformation goes to a whole nother level. Because most of us make life-changing decisions, not in our comfort zone, but when we are uncomfortable. Now, this, this might stretch you a little bit. This might even sound a little weird to you. But, but I, think, I think Christians... Like, if you're a Christ follower here this morning, if you're not, this wouldn't apply to you. But I I think Christians sometimes, um, we grieve way too much when adversity comes our way. I I mean, we we, we get all upset, and and we don't understand. And I think really what it is, it's, it's an indicator that we've put our hope in the wrong thing. We've put our hope in the wrong, wrong person. What you're going to see in the Bible and what all of history tells us is adversity is a friend to Christianity. That's what we're going to see in this story. Matter of fact, if the persecution, if the persecution that's happening in Acts chapter 8 doesn't happen, you're going to hell. How do you like that on a Sunday morning? Does that make you feel good? You understand 
in Acts chapter 1, Jesus told the disciples, listen, dudes, don't you be hanging out in Jerusalem. I need you to scatter. I need you to go out there because I got some people in Ocala, Florida, who I don't want to go to hell. I want them to go to heaven. So I, you can't stay in Jerusalem. You got to get out there into the highways and the byways. You got to go there so those people that I love in Ocala, Florida will know about Jesus. You know what they did? Yeah, we hear you, God, but no thanks. We'd be liking our Jerusalem. We'd be liking our little kind of how life, how it is. And this persecution that comes opens up the door for people like us, thousands of miles across the ocean. But we get all, man, Christians grieve. And right now this week, if I get one more text, oh, well, did you see what they've changed now already? How about the poly? Look what they've done to what, girls' sport. Look what they're doing. Oh, I mean, it, it's, it's like Jesus is still dead. Jesus is still in the tomb. I mean, because the policies that are coming out of Washington, D.C. are so much more prolific than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last time I checked, I thought maybe, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I misunderstood what the Bible says. I, I, I thought it said that we're just pilgrims passing through. I, I, I didn't realize that this was our permanent home. That like all of our hopes and all of our dreams was wrapped up here. I, I, I thought somehow that eternity had, and, and, and being with God and Jesus for all times but the idea of things changing and everything, it just, it gets us really uncomfortable, right? Here, let me see if I can help. Let me, I, I can see you're kind of struggling a little bit, right? You're from Pennsylvania. You're like, I don't know what's going on here. So let, can, can you just help me out for just a second? Can we just kind of, can I help you? Can we help each other? Here's what I want you to do. Right now, I just want you to cross your arms like, hey, I ain't listening to that guy. Just come on, just, just humor me. Come on, just do this, right? Just cross your arms like this, right? All right, you kind of do it. And some of you are like... No. At home, have you crossed your arms? Do, do you know that, that thousands and thousands of times when you've crossed your arms, you've done it exactly the same way, just like this? Right? It's, it's comfortable. It's how, you, it's how you cross your arms every single day. I'm just telling you, this is how you do it. Here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to uncross them and cross them the other way. I don't even know how to do that. Oh, that is weird. <laughs> that does not feel right. Wait a second. Ooh. Right? Doesn't that just, just like... <sighs> Here, let, let's try it a different way, right? Okay, everybody, clasp your hands. Clasp your hands, right? Every time you clasp your hands, you clasp them kind of the, the, the exact same way all the time. But, but, but watch this. Just, just move them one finger over. Clasp it just a little. I don't know that you could pray this way. <laughs> I don't think God would be able to hear my prayers crossed this way. It's uncomfortable right there's a lot of us just want to get it back how it used to be this is the way you're supposed to cross your arms this is the way you're supposed to clasp your hands what's going on i don't know what's happening and i want to say that i think right now the potential for transformation the potential for people discovering hope in Jesus Christ is at a all time high because we change. Let me tell you, I'll give you four. I can't teach this this morning. You can just write them down. People change usually in four ways. One, they hurt enough they have to. Two, they see enough they're inspired to. Three, they learn enough that they want to. And four, they receive enough that they're able to. But the one that we're going to focus on is that first one, is they hurt enough, they have to. One year ago today, nobody could even imagine what was going to happen in late February. Man, we had plans. The economy was at an all-time high. I mean, there were a lot of great things happening. Everybody's going on. It's just, it's just good. And then all of a sudden, 2020 happened, and kind of like the, 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 the shock and numb of just everything 
And I'm saying out loud this morning that in these hurting times, we have the potential and the opportunity to make a difference in our world that perhaps has never, ever been afforded to other generations. So how do we do this? What happened in this story? Persecution, change, everything gets turned upside down. Let your eyes drop down to Acts chapter 8. Here's exa- or, or down to verse 26 in chapter 8. Here's what happens. Lots of things are happening. No one wants the persecution. Nobody wants the change. Everybody wants to go back how it was. And notice what this one dude, Philip, does. Now an angel of the Lord says to Philip, one more time, God shows up. God is going to show up. He says, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way to meet an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of this treasury. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on the way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and he asked this question. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who's the prophet talking about himself? He's confused. Hey, can I just see your eyes for just a second? But Just for a second? Jesus is confusing. The Bible is confusing. God is confusing. This idea that, that somehow everybody should understand there is so much like excuse me sir where did God come from how did he show up on the scene like when was he where oh, can I ask you where did Cain get his wife I mean how, could someone please help I mean my goodness this whole parting the Red Sea was it like because it was a drought was it really like this big sea I want you to know something people who don't know Jesus they, they're, they're like this doesn't make no sense. God's got us in the world to live our lives so we can walk into people's lives that don't understand. They don't understand. They've got a wrong picture. And unfortunately, most people in our culture, their picture of God is he is an angry, old, white guy in heaven. And he is so frustrated, he's like a cop who wants to find you speeding and the moment that he does he's going to give you this guy doesn't understand who God is and God brings somebody to him I wonder who's in my life I wonder who's in your life that doesn't understand who God is maybe you're in that career for that reason. So you thought it was to make money. Maybe you're in that neighborhood. Maybe you're at that college campus. Maybe God gave you those hobbies so that you would be strategically placed so that that person who's confused and who doesn't understand who God is would begin to discover. Notice what happens next in verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him all about being a great church member. Oh, I'm sorry. I read it wrong, forgive me. Then Philip began at that very passage of Scripture and told him how to be a great conservative of political parties. What are y'all looking at me like that for? Oh, I'm sorry, I read it wrong again. Then Philip began with them at the very passage of Scripture and told him what a good Baptist, a good Presbyterian, a good Catholic, a good Pentecost. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. You've heard that story, right, about a man who fell in the pit? 
a sympathetic man, person came alongside and said, I feel your pain down there in that pit. An objective person said, it's logical that someone would fall down there in that pit. A Christian scientist came along and said, you only think that you're in a pit. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall in a pit. A mathematician calculated how he fell in the pit. Bernie Sanders promised tuition-free college for the man in the pit. Sorry, I just thought I'd slip that in there. A religionist, you deserve your pit. Confucius said, if you would have listened to me, you would not be in that pit. Buddha said, your pit is only a state of mind. A realist said, that's a pit. A scientist practice, a scientist praised him for practicing social distancing in the pit. <laughs> Sorry. Dr. Fauci asked if he had his mask on the pit. I had to do that, I'm sorry. President Trump said, vote for me and I'll build a wall around that pit. <laughs> the media reported it was President Trump's fault the man was in the pit. A little too soon? Okay, sorry. President Biden. Be careful here, Mark. Mark. It's kind. Promised greater diversity and unity to the man in the pit. The county inspector asked if he had a permit to dig a pit. The county tax assessor came along and figured the taxes he owed on the pit. A professor gave him a lecture on the elementary principles of the pit. An optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist said, things will get worse. And Jesus came alongside, looked down and saw the man in the pit and reached down and lifted him up out of the pit. So who are we going to be? You know, there's parting words of Jesus and in the Gospels and in Acts. You see this statement over and over, and he talks about go share. Go share that all you've experienced in me, Matthew 28 and 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, by all authority in heaven that's given to me. He's saying, go share this. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, he says, go share the good news with all all nations, locally, globally, right? In Luke 24, go share all that God has promised to all the nations. You are my witnesses. In John 17 and 18, go share in all the world as you sent me into the world. I have sent them, you, me, us, into the world. And then in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, you are my ambassadors, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. I find it interesting. In Acts chapter 1, God set up, God set up the disciples and all the believers for their action plan. They were to go locally, they were to go to their region and ultimately to the uttermost parts. That's what God told them to do. And then in Acts chapter 7 and chapter 8, we see all this persecution, right? It's not a happy time. Please don't tell me that there's not a consequence to disobedience to God. A lot of us are going through things right now in our life, and if we all could just get honest, it's directly connected to either your obedience or your disobedience to God. And you're like, wait a second, so God just wants me to be a puppet. Not at all. But God, who is the creator of the universe, God, who is the creator of you, he knows what's best. He's trying to set us up to walk in a line that will be best for our lives. The problem is we are humans, and we think that we know better than God. And when we think that we know better than God, it takes us off that God path. It began in Genesis. It continues in your life and my life to this very day. And we get to the side, and the pain and the problems and the suffering that's coming through our lives is because we did not trust God at his word. So let's try to wind this down. First of all, I'll give this to you. Whatever you perceive, 
Whatever situation that you think in the world that needs to be fixed, I don't know what that is, you do, but whatever you think that there's an inequity, there's a problem, that needs to be changed. I just want you to know that Jesus is your best shot at that change. When we put Jesus on the scene, Jesus is our best hope. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is, whatever you're frustrated about, whatever a spouse or a neighbor or a coach, a teacher, uh, whatever that is, Jesus is always our best hope. When you put Jesus on the scene, the miraculous is now possible. So how are you doing with that this week? Number two is this. This story of Philip when he went down to talk to this Ethiopian, he could only share with him what he had already possessed. In other words, the way I would say it to you is this way, is you can't share what you don't have. I, I, I could stand here right now and want to share a, a Snickers candy bar with you. I have full intentions. I want to share a Snickers candy bar. If you have a Snickers bar on you right now and you want to share with me, I'm okay with that too. But I would really like to do that. But here's the problem. I can reach into my pocket and I don't have a Snickers candy bar. I can say it. I can hope for it. But I can't share with you what I don't have. And I wonder if the reason many of us don't share our faith and just hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm not trying to cause any doubt in anybody's mind, but I wonder if they're one of the real reasons we don't share our faith with anybody else is because we really don't have faith. Hey, you, can watch, you can watch the NFL game this afternoon, but that don't make you an NFL ball player. The Bible teaches us incredibly clear that when you become a follower of Jesus your life changes it doesn't mean that you become perfect but something inside of you when we begin to understand that it is the story of Jesus Christ that gives us hope it's not our country it's Jesus when we begin to understand it is the story of Jesus that gives us hope it's not our education it's not how we vote it's not who's in the White House it's not with the economy when we begin to understand that Jesus Christ is our singular hope and we're living that out it becomes normal and natural for us to show share Jesus but you can't share what you don't have so let me ask you this question who do you know who do I know that doesn't understand Jesus who do you know who does not understand Jesus who do you know is it a coworker? Is it a family member? Is it a friend from high school? Who do you know who doesn't understand God? And let me ask you this question. What are you going to do about it? What, 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 what are you going to do about it? Like, if you know Jesus and you know God, and you believe what God says in his word, what are you going to do about it? You see, for transformation to happen, this is really good. And I'm going to share more about this, but this, I just began thinking about this week, because I was trying to, I've been trying to ask God, how do we deal with some of the anger that we feel about what is? And I think this, I, I think for real transformation to happen, there has to be some, some kind of anger. There has to be this righteous anger inside about what is. And I think there is. There, there, there's anger. Now, if, if, if you have uncontrolled anger, then you, you have confusion. But having a sense of, of anger of what is, you have to have the, 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 the partner word of anger would be then hope. I have anger about what is, but I have hope of what can be. And when those two emotions, when those two are in play, transformation. Now, if you just have hope, right? We have hope. We kind of have this panacea that our hope is good. I mean, everybody's good. It's daisies and it's unicorns and everybody's nice. And we get a stimulus check every single month. And I, uh, there, you, you need a little bit of anger inside. Like, 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 like wait a second. 
I'm troubled by what is, but I have hope in Jesus of what can be. So here's what I want to do. I want to send you out the door. I'm going to put a little handles on you. Uh, I don't have time. I have taught this before, but I want to at least give it to you on the screen. And it'll be uh, at least a tool for you as you think about who your one person is who doesn't understand who God is, right? So on this is, is what I call one verse evangelism. Um, I've done this on, on, in restaurants hundreds of times and shared. But basically, if I could come to the side, you see to the far left before Christ, to the far right, after Christ. Your story before Christ is your story. Nobody will ever argue with your story. This is what my story was like before Christ. And let me just say this with all the Christian love in the world because I know I'm in the South. Southerners still love me. You didn't always know God. You didn't always know God. There is a line in the sand. Salvation is a line in the sand where you consciously are aware I am lost. I am headed to a real place called hell. God so loved me that he sent his son Jesus. I can't fix it. I can't save myself. If I don't lean in and accept Christ as my savior, I have no hope. You might know about God, but let me tell you something. You might know about Tom Brady, but you ain't at his house for Thanksgiving. There's a big difference between knowing about and knowing him personally. Becoming born again is me stepping over and understanding I need Jesus to save me. Before Christ, I'm lost. Nobody will ever argue with you about your life before Christ. It's your story. And there's hundreds of BC stories. Thousands of BC stories. Because it's your story. Not one of our stories are the same. This is how your life was. It was less than until I... Now, how you come to Christ, there is one way. And our culture does not like that because our culture wants there to be many, 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 many different ways. You can put coexist on the back of your car, bumper sticker, all you want. But there is one name given under heaven whereby we must be, na- must be saved and his name is Jesus, right? There is one way to God the Father. It is through Jesus. And I've outlined for you one verse in the Bible. This is Romans chapter 6 and 23. I should have put that up there for you. So, so write that in your notes. That's Romans 6, 23. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. You take a picture. You share what your story was like. This is what my life was like before I met Jesus. Wages, sin, death. I have no help. I have no hope. I have no life. Then I heard about Jesus. I make a decision for Jesus. I step into this story of following Jesus. Now, because of the gift of God, eternal life, I have help. I have hope and I have life. Here's the other part. The after Christ story. I think this is one reason why many people aren't interested in our God, aren't interested in Jesus. Because our after Christ story really isn't different from people who don't have Christ in their life. Our marriages blow up just like everybody else who doesn't know Jesus. We're we're addicted to, to alcohol and to porn and to drugs. We BCD like everybody else. We blame, we complain, we defend. We're all worried because of what happens in Washington, D.C., just like everybody else. Our after Christ story should be so much different. Our after Christ story should be like we're walking around stoned. (laughs) Hey, whoa, baby, how you doing? Hey, life's good. Why? Because we're not drunk with wine, but we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We've got the presence of God in us. Yes, there's things around us that don't look good. In the book of the Acts, the people are being stoned. They're being, and I'm not talking about stoned. I'm talking about like stones to kill you, right? I mean, they're being imprisoned. Families are being torn up. They have to scatter. But they walked with a blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. This is the kind of life we want to live. This is the kind of life that you want to have for your family. This is the kind of life. If there's something in the culture, if there's something in our country that you want to see changed, this is how we change it. When one person discovers their hope is in Jesus, and then that person shares the story, and another person discovers hope in Jesus, and another person discovers hope in Jesus, and another person discovers hope in Jesus, this is how we step into a culture that's hurting and broken. 
This is how you wake up tomorrow and say, wait, I don't like what's happening. I don't, I just, ah, but. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Let's stand and pray. We don't need to waste any more time because I know you got people on your mind. We don't need to waste no more time because you got people on your mind. Poet, and I didn't even know it. You can take that one verse evangelism. Hey, online, um, our team that's online, will you drop that image? Let's make sure that we got that image about one verse evangelism. And, and note for everybody, it is Romans 6 and 23. We're going to build on this over the next coming weeks. So um, I just want you to be encouraged, and I want us to step out in a culture that is so dark. I want us to be the kind of people that don't curse the darkness. There is plenty to curse the darkness about. There's a lot of things in our culture that are really dark that make no sense at all. But you've got a decision to make. Are you going to give your one and only life to cursing the darkness? Or are you going to step out and be the light? <laughs> to shine the light of God's word on what's happening around us. In my prayer this morning, if you've never begun a relationship with Jesus, today's your day. Today is the day to begin following Jesus Christ. And if you make a decision with me today to follow after Jesus, I want you to text the word. In a moment, we're going to pray. But then after our gathering, um, you can text me the word today to 63566. And um, I'll send you some info on how you can continue in following after Jesus. Cool? God, I love you. And I'm so thankful that... Um, a story of persecution in Acts chapter 7 and 8 can bring so much inspiration to us. January 2021. God, a lot of things around us bother us. A lot of decisions got us all frustrated. But God, would you make us the kind of people who sees a man in a pit and reaches down like Jesus, builds a bridge for them to understand who you are. God, if there's one person, in fact, if you are that one person, you're here right now and you don't know Jesus, I want you to have this conversation. Jesus, I need you. Save me. I have sinned. And Jesus, you died on the cross and came alive again. And today, I trust you as my Savior. And people who are making that decision this morning, God, may they walk in your hope. May they walk in your peace. Bless this gathering of people. Give us the courage and the boldness to walk out into the lives of people who don't understand who you are, God, like Philip, and help us to share nothing but the story of Jesus, how our life was before Christ, how we came to Christ, and now how awesome our life is after making a decision for Jesus. We sure do love you. We pray everything in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Peace.